Hi, my name is Mike Guthrie. My wife Patty and I took a great trip to the Iberian Peninsula in 2019 where we visited Spain, Portugal, Morocco, Gibraltar, France, and Andorra. This segment of the video is part two of a two-part series that covers the second half of our trip through mostly half of Morocco, half of Spain, and up into the Pyrenees. It was a great adventure, and we saw a lot of great uh, architecture and history, and strongly encourage people who get a chance to go see the world. It's a wonderful place. Um, you may remember from our last episode that we were traveling in a place called Iberia. And as I recall, nobody knew where that was. And so we could have a test to see if anybody remembers where it is, but that won't be necessary. You may remember that at the end of the presentation that we had just finished uh, visiting the souk or the market in the, uh, the city of Fez, F-E-S. And <clears throat> because of the size of our tour group, they split us into two groups because it was, it's too congested in that area for large crowds to go through as a tour group, as a single group. So as it turns out, the, uh, the group we were not in got to visit the place in this picture. And how many remember what this place is? Yes, Dory? It's a tannery for all different kinds of animal hides. They do sheep, camel, horse, cows, and who knows what else are in those vats. So those are the dying vats that you see. So when we got back, the two groups got back together, we uh, met at a leather shop, which is typical of these tours where the guides take you to these commercial outfits and they get a kickback for anything that's sold to the tourists. And so we got back there and heard that the other group got to go to this tannery. And I was really unhappy about it because I wanted to see that once I got to, saw the picture. And uh, so that's, that's a preface for where we're going to uh, visit in the middle of tonight's presentation. It's all about the tannery and my frustration with not being able to see it. Next. After we left Fez, one of the stops that the tour people put us on was to visit a tile uh, factory where they make mosaics. And as what you're seeing there are a bunch of tables and fountains and all different kinds of uh, handmade, all handmade mosaics. Next. Next. This is how they do those tables. Guys sitting on the floor and they, they make them upside down. So they lay all the tiles upside down in these intricate patterns and then when it's all finished then they pour the backing on uh, like a concrete type thing to make the, the base, the foundation of the table. But there are thousands of pieces of tile in here. Next. There's a, a copy or a, a example of one that's had the the backing poured. Next. This is how they make the tiles. They have this row of guys sitting all day long with hand chisels chiseling out individual pieces to make either new mosaics or repair old ones that they're trying to restore from an old building for example. And they do it all by hand. Next. And here's a guy, you can see that there's a, the piece in front of him is damaged, the upper left corner of that blue square. And so he's hand fitting a piece to repair that and restore it to where it's usable where it came from. But it's all hand work. You can see all those bags of little pieces, nothing goes to waste. You never know when you're going to need something just that shape. Next. This is their kiln. Uh, I don't remember what they use for firing it. I think they use some kind of agricultural byproduct, almond husks or something. 
and you can see on the top of the shelf, you can see the, the fire feed is on the bottom where the little circled the discs are, and then uh, they stack all the, the ware, the, the porcelain ware, in the top section next, and that's how they fire it. They close the door and let it cook overnight. Now, how many, how many people have been to Morocco? One, two, three, three. Okay, you three are prohibited from answering the next question. Okay, when you think, when you hear the, of the country of Morocco, what kind of visual picture do you get? I'm sorry? Crowded? Wait, well, aren't you one of the three? What else? What do you think of when, when you hear Morocco or think of Morocco in a movie? What, what kind of image do you get? What do you think of the countryside? Water. Water? Do you know where Morocco is? Yeah. Only drinking water, if you're lucky. No, but what does it look like? What does the country look like? If you're going to travel through the country, what do you get? Desert. Thank you, Bruce. Desert. desert. Yeah, I, that's what I thought. I thought the whole country was nothing but desert. Uh, next. It isn't. This is uh, coming out of uh, Fez, going to Marrakesh, which is kind of in the middle of the country. Next. It's all very verdant, agricultural land. This one that you can't see so well, but above the tree line in the middle are a bunch of sheep. They have a lot of livestock, lots of crops, lots of green. And it blew me away, because I was expecting sand dunes and camels uh, the whole time. Do they get a lot of rain? They did, when we were there, they got rain because, uh, I'll show you in a later picture, um, it depends on where you are in the country. This is right on the coast. In fact, you may even be able to pick up the ocean behind the top tree line. Uh, but this is what we saw, and I was just absolutely astonished that it was green. Next. Now, this is uh, not an atypical picture of how people live there. It's like Portland. Portland? No, no, it's upscale Portland. It looks like Tijuana or any of a hundred other places that we've seen all over the world. But it also has one common characteristic with other places like this that we've seen. What do you see on the roofs of those shacks? Satellite dishes. At least two dozen satellite dishes. We have discovered that no matter how squalid the living arrangements may appear from the outside, we didn't go inside, so we don't know what they're like. They could be wonderful. Um, but the, the proliferation of satellite dishes is universal. They have them everywhere. Everywhere. Next. Now, this is... Uh, I mentioned last time that... Um, Morocco has the second oldest monarchy behind the country of Japan. And they love their king there. And the king does pretty well by his people. And one of the big pushes in the last decade or so is to improve the uh, living arrangements, the housing opportunities for people to get them from the shacks into these high-rise apartment buildings. And these were along the freeway within a couple of miles the entire time we were uh, traveling from Fez to Marrakesh, and uh, they're built by the thousands, even though for the most part we didn't see too many that were finished. Uh, but there are a lot of them in progress, and the, the people in the country are very excited about getting uh, upscale lodging. Next. This is a finished version. Uh, again, mile after mile after mile they're building these things. Next. Now, we're getting a little bit outside of the agricultural area, moving towards, uh, further towards Marrakesh, next. And this is now kind of more the image that I had before we got there, where you've got that desert kind of environment with the, the adobe or brick 
housing units and buildings. And this is kind of what I expected when we got there. Next. But this is the uh, outcome of a recent rain. It was actually a flood. You could see evidence of flash flooding in the area. But it's still, if you look at behind, it's still kind of deserty, but closer to the river, uh, totally agricultural. Next. OK. Welcome to Marrakesh. How many know anything about Marrakesh? You know any songs about Marrakesh? Yeah. Right. Do you know the, the foundation of that song? Well, they were on a train. They weren't going to Marrakesh, but they needed something to do on the train. So they got stoned out of their minds, and they missed their stop and ended up in Marrakesh. And that's supposedly the story behind the song, uh, Going to Marrakesh. So this is the, uh, what they call Gemma al Fana, is huge marketplace in the Medina of Marrakesh, which is the fifth largest city in the country. Uh, Marrakesh dates back to uh, about the 1070 AD and uh, has a population of 839,000. So it's, it's no small city. Uh, this is uh, the main plaza called Gemma al Fana, And during the daytime, this is what you see. And underneath most of those green tarps you see are vendors selling everything you can imagine. Um, and it's crowded. There are people there just packed in. Next. One of the things that people do is they look for ways to make money by demonstrating everything from monkeys wearing diapers uh, to dancers and musicians and anybody make out what's on the ground left of the umbrella? Snakes. snakes. Yeah, there's a cobra and two other supposedly poisonous snakes and, and they're trying to get people to come over and take pictures of the snakes and then pay a toll for the privilege. Well, I wasn't going to pay no toll, uh, take pictures from stinking snakes. So I took this picture from about 150 feet away using a zoom. And I'd no sooner snapped the shutter than some guy comes running up to me demanding money. From 150 feet away, he's, he's demanding money. And I said, what for? He said, you take picture snake. I said, no. I'm taking a picture of the, the plaza. And so I was pretty insistent, and he left. Uh, but I got my picture, and I didn't pay. Next. This is what it looks like at night. The, and you can see how big it is. It's several blocks on a side. And the center part is uh, transforms from daytime to nighttime. All the people, or most of the vendors and things that were there in the daytime, leave. And everything you see undercover here is a restaurant. They're pop-up restaurants, and it's the go-to place to have dinner in the city. And there are just dozens and dozens and dozens of these restaurants. And all the other stuff is gone. Next. This is the area surrounding the center of the plaza. There's a lot of permanent uh, vendors and, and sellers of all things Moroccan and Chinese. Uh, next, you, you can see that this is pretty unusual because there's no people in the middle, but uh, this is a clothing section and they have things generally grouped by uh, type of goods. Next, here's a guy making chess sets while he's waiting for customers that aren't there. Next, and here's your little Aladdin slipper shop. Uh, Patty tried some on or try to look at some, but the quality was extremely poor. Uh, we didn't want to invest in it. Pardon me? Did you? Where are they? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I lost them in the other hundred pair of shoes in the closet. Uh, my bad. N next. So this is, this is a very typical um, way of doing business. This, there's no Walmart there that I know of, but this is where the locals do their shopping, and they buy everything. Everything is there. Next. 
Next. Now this is a good one. This is a sheep or a lamb, I don't know how old it was, that had just been taken out of a cooker. And people were lined up there because they knew what time it was coming out to get their takeout meal for their families for the evening. And there's like five guys cutting on this thing and they're bagging it up and people are buying it and taking it off lickety split. Now I, I was able to blow up the sign in the center and make out the name of the outfit and so I googled that and found out they're a thing. They have a restaurant, they have a Facebook page, they have a website, they have an online ordering takeout kind of thing. So this is, it looks kind of rudimentary and kind of crude the way they've been doing things for thousands of years, but it's, it's definitely 21st century operation. Next. And if you can see well enough, on, the, on both the right hand side and the back, those are all olives different types of olives and if you look at the stacks of the jars there's got to be 25 or 30 different varieties in, in each of those booths. Um, it, it's amazing what they have and it's not just Morocco we saw the same thing in Spain and Portugal. Next. What do they use for money? What do they use for money? Well, coins and currency I think. The dollar. <laughs> no no they have their own currency. Um, uh, and they use, you know, they take credit cards. A lot of places do, not everybody. Um, trying to think of what the unit of currency is there. Dinar, maybe? Um, I don't remember. Um, here's a purse shop. Next. And, and then during the daytime, here's a nursery right in the middle of the, of the plaza of, uh, of Jama. Or Jama. Next. And then this, this appears during the daytime. They've got fruit and juice. Juice bars are a big thing there. They squeeze it right there in front of you. Um, I'm just not sure about the sanitariness of it, but uh, we didn't try it. But that's, again, those are all gone at night and replaced by restaurants. Next. Now this really got my attention. This was a vendor, a night vendor, um, on the fringes of the, of the Gemma. And he's selling uh, fossils and mineral specimens. And for those who don't know, I collect minerals and try to get stuff from different countries when we visit. And this guy had some really nice stuff, and I bought a few pieces from him. And Morocco is well known for its minerals and one of the prime fossil locations on the planet. Uh, although you have to be careful that they're not made in China. You have to check for that little sticker on there. Next. Yeah, this is outside the, the Gemma, and this is a very typical shop um, in the shopping area, and they're drying out their uh, spices. So these are spice sellers, and they're everywhere. Next. Some of them put them in baskets, some of them lay them on the ground. And I've all, always wondered, every time I see one of these vendors, I look at the variety and the volume of material they have there, and I just wonder, what kind of shape is the stuff in at the bottom of the basket? You ever wonder that? What, what kind, you know, how long has it been there? Because I don't think, the way they've got it stacked there in these perfect pyramids, they're not rotating that stock, right? So, inquiring minds, which is... It's possible. It's possible. It's possible. I never stuck my hand down there to find out. Next. Okay, now what do we have here? What kind of bugs? Bees, honeybees. They, uh, <laughs> this is another common thing you see over there is in the fruits, ca or the, the sweets cabinets, the candy cabinets, which they also have a lot of. Uh, the bees like sugar just as much as the people do. And so they get to share the sweets with, uh, with the vendor. It's a very common, very common sight. Next. You may remember from episode one that in Fez that they use all manner of transportation inside the Medina. 
in Fez, you may remember if you were here or watched the video, the uh, Fez was a, a traffic free zone, a motor vehicle free zone. It's too compact, too tight, not enough room, so everything has to be done by uh, animal. Donkeys, horses, hand carts, push carts. In this town, they allow motorized vehicles in the form of uh, little three-wheelers or motorcycles, and they just go right down this, the sidewalk with the, or the passageway with the people that are shopping there. Next, there's a three-wheeler. Uh, next, and more scooters and bikes, and it's it's packed. It's crowded. Um, next, more of the same. That one's that little trailer there is being pulled by a horse. And that's how they deliver their goods into these tight spaces. Next. This is uh, the food area. I switch from days to nights here on you. Next. Uh, anyone for a sheep's head? Apparently they're quite the delicacy because they were all over the joint. Um, yeah, not for me. Next. Okay, this was our supper. This place, um, wow. It really looked and smelled good, and so we tried it. This particular meal consisted of uh, lamb tahini, beef and lamb and chicken skewers, sausages, rice, vegetables, bread, and olives. And that meal cost us, if I remember correctly, about $19 for both of us. Uh, and it was delicious. At least that's the way I remember it. Honey, you remember it different? Yeah, it was pretty pretty tasty. Next. And from last time, we also saw many pictures of these. Remember what they are? They, they had them on the power uh, pylon towers. What? It's a bird. Very good. Moving on. Uh, what, can, <coughs> what kind of bird? Those are storks. They're huge. The nests are huge. They'll nest just about anywhere. They migrate from Africa on their, you know, every annual, and they go back to the same nest and the same mates um, every year. Next. Okay, now let me get my assistant out here. Down here is the Gemma where all those vendors and things are here. And in the corner, one corner, we happen to be the northeast corner, right there where that blue line starts. I, I, I spent an extra day down there. Patty was doing something different, but I love exploring these shops and the people and just the soaking in the environment. So I'm walking there in the early afternoon and there's a kid standing there and he approaches me he had to be like 14 and he comes up to me and says you want to see the tannery and i'm going what how does he know that i want to see the tannery how does he know and so i said what do you mean he says well the tannery you go see the tannery it's very interesting and he said he said, and you've got to go now because they're shutting down for the season this week and they're only going to be open a couple more days. Well, I'm only going to be there for the rest of the afternoon. So I said, he says, I'll tell you what, it's, you go down to the end of this street, this is how he gave me directions, here, and then uh, I walked about half the distance on that short blue line there and he caught up with me. And, he said, and I said, well, which way do I go now? He says, you go right. He says, wait, I'll take you. I said, oh, okay. So he brings this motorbike up, and he says, get on. Okay, and I'm thinking, well, wait, this is my dream. I want to see the tannery, and we're not going to spend any more time where there are tanneries in this country. So I get on, and I got my little backpack with me. I'm carrying a wallet with my passport and $1,000 in U.S. cash. And as I'm getting on and he's taking off, I'm starting to think which I didn't think of before I got on because I was so preoccupied with the tannery and he looked so innocent, right? So I'm thinking, okay, I got to be really attentive here 
so I can find my way back. And so we go up here, and he takes a right, and I'm thinking, okay, there's the tire store. And then we go down a little bit, and he takes another jog, and there's the, the little market on the corner. And we go down a little bit further, and there's the bakery there. And after about four turns or jogs in the road, I've lost it. I'm, I can't memorize any more landmarks to get back. And we go for like two kilometers. And he's going in, and this is in the deep heart of the Arab Quarter, where there's no English speakers, no visible evidence of civil authority whatsoever. And we go and go and go, and I'm thinking, mm hmm. I'll be lucky to see the light of day tomorrow morning. And so we go, and we go, and we go, and we go up here, and we go to that red dot. And next picture. And this is what it says. Tannery and Nakla. And so, good news is, there's actually a tannery here. Right? There it is. It says right there. Okay? Bad news is, I don't know where I am or how to get out of here. And no phone, no, nothing, you know? Next. So this is the entrance to the tannery. Now when I get there, the owner meets me and he's got his big long black robes on and his little turban hat and he's going to give me the $64 tour. Uh, so he says, come in, come see my, my, my tannery. And the first thing he hands me is a handful of mint leaves. Any idea why? You're supposed to take these mint leaves and crush them and inhale them to drown out the smell of these rotten carcass thing skins and all the flesh that's soaking in those chemical tanks. And I said, I don't need no stinking leaves. Uh, and I didn't use them because I can't stand the smell of mint. So anyway, this is... This is not the same picturesque picture that I had earlier with all the colorful tanks and the aerial view, but this is how they do it. Next. So there's the, the hides right next to the tank, and the stuff that's in those tanks is caustic. I mean, these are, these are chemicals that are probably banned in five out of seven continents, and it was odiferous, to be honest with you. Next. And here's some sheepskins that they'd done. I think the others were cow skins. Next. And this, this is kind of getting towards the finished product. And he, this is the, my guide here showing off. And, uh, and it was, I mean, it was interesting because you look at what they started with and how it ends up, and it's like, wow, that's amazing how they do that. What's even more amazing is how these young men in their 20s and teens can work in that stuff all day long and still have their fingers intact, right? Next. This is an area where they dry them out. I think these, I can't be for sure. What, they're probably cow again. Uh, they had some camel there. But they're, they're laying everywhere. This place is huge, and there's stuff hanging and stacked and drying and different stages of processing. Next. And there's another set of tanks. There's a wall between them. And uh, you can see the hides stacked at the, towards the top. Just stacks and stacks and stacks. Because, you know, Morocco is real famous for its leather. That's it's a big commodity there. Next. Oh, back. Back one. Okay. So, the, the tour being over, I had more pictures, but I'm trying to keep it brief. So, if I get out of here at a time that doesn't evoke the wrath of the uh, new, newly elected president. Um, and, and so, uh, at the end, he escorts me out. And the kid on the motorbike standing there waiting. And so uh, at that point in time, they present me with the bill. Not previously negotiated. Not previously alluded to. Uh, but nonetheless, they were expecting something. So I offered them, I, I think they, some places take U.S. currency. I'd, offer, I'd offered them the equivalent of five bucks, which is like, you know, several hours worth of wages for the average worker there. And uh, the uh, owner got incensed. He was just absolutely insulted at such a paltry offer and, and felt that that was just below his dignity to accept that minimal amount of money. 
And I knew it was a fair amount because I knew what tips were going for other services. But I'm thinking this. Here I am, deep in the Arab quarter of Marrakesh, yeah. with no English speakers around, and I've got all my goods on my shoulder, and I could end up in one of those vats and come out nothing but a pile of bones and be tanned and, and, and stained and offered for sale in the leather shop that was three blocks away that belonged to the guy's brother, of course, which I had to make an obligatory stop at. Uh, so I figured, well, if I want to get out of here, I better sweeten the pot a little bit. <laughs> so I, I think I doubled it and offered them each that amount, and they took it reluctantly, which they didn't have to do, because all he could say is, here, come back inside with me. Let me show you some more. So that was the, that was the highlight. I think that was the highlight of the entire trip for me, uh, not the least of which was I clearly made it out alive. Uh, but it was such an adventure. It was just one of those moments in time that not everybody gets to do that. Did so, you uh, tip the motorbike driver? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, because I wasn't back yet. <laughs> but I don't think I tipped him until we got back. In fact, I told him that. I said, I'll give you yours when you take me back. Uh, not that he had to be respectful of that, because he knew he had me. So anyway, we get back to the hotel late that afternoon and I get where we have Wi-Fi and I Google this tannery. I found out that that tannery has been there since the 11th century. It's a thing. I mean, and people go visit it all the time. However, what I learned from the internet was there's a thing called, a, a website called How to Avoid the Tannery Scam in Marrakesh. <laughs> And so I read it, and the way it unfolded for me was like it was scripted from that web page. It was, it was a very polished, standard approach that they use on tourists all the time, and they fall for it like I did, even though they didn't have any clue that I really had this fetish for the, going to a tannery. Um, he had no way of knowing that, but this works. People do this all the time, and they go. So anyway, I got back. So that, after Marrakesh, we left and drove up the coastline, and we went to Rabat, which was the capital, and there they showed us the uh, palace of the prince, or the king, and his deceased brothers and whatnot, and all of which are located in mosques. Every stop had some obligatory visit at some mosque, because uh, that's what they do on tours down there because there's not much else to see. Uh, so we went to Rabat. This is all in the same day. We went to Casablanca, found, saw, got a picture of Rick's place um, from the movie, and had lunch there on the on the on the coast. And we went up to uh, in Casablanca. We had a little bit of free time, so I found a, another souk because I just love going to those places. So I spent an hour or so there. And then we uh, headed up to Tangier, which is on the north coast across the Straits of Gibraltar from Spain. And that was the spot where we caught our ferry to go back to Spain because our tour ended up back in Madrid, which is where we started. So um, we spent the better part of a day in Gibraltar. Now, when you think of Gibraltar, what comes to mind? What? I can't hear. Monkeys. Monkeys. Okay. What What do you think of as as a geographical place? Gibraltar. Rock of Gibraltar. And what is that? Next picture. This is this is the Rock of Gibraltar, which is the logo for Prudential Insurance. Okay, now how many decades have we been staring at some iteration of that rock? Forever, since we were kids, right? And all this time, I thought it was an island. Did anybody else ever think it was an island? No, they're not going to raise their hands. Well, what is it then? 
It's a rock, but how, how's it how's it fixed to the rest of whatever? If it's not an island, it's got to be attached to something. What's it attached to? Spain. Yeah, next next picture. There it is. It looks like an island to me, but next, it's not very big. Here's the here's the uh, access point. This one. This is the border between Gibraltar, which is an English uh, territory, and Spain. And you you can drive over there, but we walked. They parked a bus on this side, so we walked over. And I found out my bubble was completely burst. That it's a peninsula. It's it is not an island. And I always thought. I mean, and I'm kind of not ignorant of geography, but I didn't know this one. Next. And here's what everybody thinks of when they think of Gibraltar. It's the uh, Gibraltar macaques, uh, next, which are extremely friendly. This is a member of our tour group. Um, this particular macaque uh, took up residence without being invited. And uh, he, they would do that all the time. They'd jump on people and sit on their shoulder. And the thing you always had to worry about is what are they going to do while they're sitting up there? Oh yes, they do. They 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 do different biological functions while perched <laughs> on your shoulder. None of which you would allow if you had a choice. Next, this is a, a cavern inside the rock. Next, next, okay. That's called Saint Michael's Cave, and it's a pretty good size. I mean, it doesn't compare to to uh, Carlsbad or some of the other major caverns in the world. But it's, it's extremely, you can see it's extremely uh, diversified in the types of stalactites and stalagmites that are growing there. And they've been there for uh, obviously many, 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 many thousands of years. The problem with trying to get good photos here is they got this thing all spruced up for tourists. And a uh, previous picture, hon? They have all these light shows going on, and they've got blue, and they got pink, and they got red next, and they've got green, and and the timing between the lights changing is so short you can't hardly get a clean picture of the whiteness of the stalactites and stalagmites. So it, it's it's quite an interesting place. I mean, we're, I'm glad we went, but it doesn't give you a unburnished view of the thing. Next. Um, these caves are quite interesting if you've never visited one. Next. Next. Okay. Then we left Tangier, landed in Spain, and headed, uh, before we got here, we headed to a town called Torre Molinas. And Torre Molinas is a lovely village on the coast of the Mediterranean. It's typical Mediterranean architecture with the, the whitewashed brick buildings in the older sections. Um, has a lovely promenade uh, along the coast, flanked by restaurants and shops. And we, we didn't do much there except walk the promenade and we had a, a catered dinner. And the dinner was just spectacular. We had um, salad bread, fried anchovies, Okay, now, how many of you ever had fresh fried anchovies as opposed to canned anchovies? Anybody? Dory has? Mm -hmm. What's the difference? The bones are in it. Okay, what's the flavor like? Oh, way better. Oh, unbelievable. You wouldn't know it's the same fish. No, so now, Patty, tell them about it. We're going back to Lisbon in two weeks or three weeks. And high on her list of things to do while we're there is to find some fried anchovies. They were so, so delicious. And again, you would not know from the, the fresh version that they were anchovies. Because all we know is, you know, pizzas and cedar salads. And most people can't stomach it on either. So we had scampi, we had grouper, cockles, salted sea bass. And, uh, of course, ice cream. It was a really nice meal. That's what we remember about that place. Next. 
Oh, go back one. I forgot to tell you what you're looking at here. This is, uh, before we got to Grenada, which is where you're looking, we stopped in Malaga. And Malaga is famous because it's the childhood home of Picasso. So we got to tour the childhood home of Picasso, and it was kind of unremarkable. Um, not all that old, because he was turn of the century vintage. Um, but we did get pictures of us sitting next to his statue on a bench out in front of his house. Um, we tried to put that on eBay. Um, nobody wanted to buy him. Okay, so this is uh, Granada. Before we got to Granada, we stopped at an interesting place that was a, a olive oil mill where they press the olives. And so we got to go on a tour of the plant and see how, they, how the olives come in, how they process them, how they load them, unload them, how they squeeze it, and show us the product. And of course, they just, out of the goodness of their hearts, gave us an opportunity to purchase some of their goods. Um, but it was interesting to see how it was made. It was a process you don't see much over here. Um, then after we toured the olive mill, we had a included lunch with a local family. And this was a, you know, normally, how many have been into local family meals on out of country trips? Sometimes they're kind of hokey, aren't they? It's just a, a way for some of the locals to make an extra buck or two. And it's not always spectacular. Uh, we went to one in Croatia that was pretty m mundane. But this particular one in Grenada was really, really nice. The, the lady of the house had a lovely home. It was very much what we would expect to see here in terms of furnishings and modern, modernization. It was just really lovely. And the food was great. And there was lots of it. And the hostess was amazing. So that was a, you know, a, a good little included tour that they had for us. And it, it was very enjoyable. So it kind of changed my view of those activities. This, what you're looking at is Alhambra. You ever hear of the Alhambra? It is a, uh, started out in 1238 is when they started building this. And as you know from the last segment of this presentation, uh, over the centuries, these places underwent conquest and and deconquest and reconquest and unconquest and they got changed many many times they were added to they were torn down they were damaged semi destroyed and so what you see today is not exactly what it was like in the beginning this is a, a very well worked over facility but it's pretty spectacular and as most of the castle type fortress type buildings we encountered in all the countries we visited. It started off as a, a palace, but as palaces were prone to do, they were built in positions of defensibility, so they ended up being forts slash palaces just to protect the, the rulers from the conquering hordes. Uh, next. This, the grounds of this place are massive and extremely beautiful. And it's, it's hard to imagine that some of these fountains were built hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago before electricity. So you wonder, how did they make that work? You know, inquiring minds want to know. Next. Here's some of the gardens, uh, with, again, with the water feature. Next. Uh, they had, a, I guess, an eye towards Halloween with their mazes. Um, and I just can't even imagine trying to keep those manicured. Uh, but they're all over the place. And, and if you look at the, the tile work on the ground, this is typical uh, Moorish design architecture. And we showed a lot of pictures of uh, how beautiful the Moors. Uh, they were great architects. They were great artisans, great craftsmen. The, the things that they put together were astonishing. Next. Next. This is some of the tile work that they do. If you go back to the tile factory we visited, knowing that they do all these things by hand, they cut the pieces by hand, they put them together by hand, 
and these are massive. They cover walls, ceilings, exterior, interior, walkways, you name it. Next. Now this is a mystery to me. As I mentioned earlier, I collect minerals. So I, I kind of have an eye towards geology. These are, this is one of many, many pillars in one of the uh, areas within the palace that had a big open uh, gathering spot. And they had all these pillars around this area and they were all perfectly round and polished with all these rocks in it. Okay, so I'm being inquisitive, want to know how did they do that? How did they, first of all, cut the stone out of the ground, make it round, almost perfectly so to the visible eye, naked eye, and then polish the entire surface, grinding those rocks down, and do it a thousand years ago? I don't know the answer. I still have the question. If anyone can enlighten me, please see me after so I can sleep tonight. <laughs> Next. Again, you can see the... Go back one. The... Uh, the uh, detail of the stonework, the carvings, the windows, the ceilings, everything is very, very uh, delicately done and beautiful. I mean, there, there's very little architecture of that vintage that can rival what the, the Muslims did. They were very, very skilled craftsmen. Okay, so after uh, we left Granada, we went back to Madrid and we um, had a farewell dinner and we spent some time with a gentleman from Australia that we had met on the tour <laughs> and uh, he was a mayor of a, a town called Birdsville in Queensland, the state of Queensland, Australia. He's the owner of Rosebirth Cattle Station which consists of 2,000 square miles of land and 10,000 head of cattle. And the province that he's, that he, the Birdsville is in, which is only a couple hundred people, the province is the size of the country of Portugal. That's the scale of things in Australia. So I was intrigued by this guy. He gave me his business card. We, we talked a lot about his business. And they were worried because they were having a flood at the time. And he showed pictures of his, his house was up on a little plateau and the entire area surrounding it was underwater. Oh. Uh, and it was not common. Floods in the outback of Australia is not common. So anyway, I was interested in this guy, so I, I Googled him after, the, after we split up in Madrid. And it turns out he was very famous for posing in the nude and posting the pictures on the city's computer. And this was, a, this was news all over the country. He was world famous, a naked mayor. Uh, you never know who you're going to run into on these tours, right? So our tour ended, I'm sorry? <laughs> Sounded interesting. I just can't hear when people are facing away. So um, when we got to Madrid, that was the end of the tour. Except we had, uh, I wanted Patty to see Barcelona. Uh, if you've been to Barcelona, you know that you need to go to Barcelona at least once in your life, right? So, um, so we took the train from Madrid to Barcelona, 313 miles, one stop, average speed 180 miles per hour, and you couldn't feel the train move. It was smooth as silk. She knows what I'm talking about. Oh, you, so you've been to Spain, Spain? Yeah, huh? I did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> 13 miles a day walking. Well, you should have taken a train. It was a lot smoother. Yeah, I did take a train. <laughs> <laughs> to Portugal. Uh, it's from Madrid. <laughs> so we got to Barcelona on the fast train. And uh, we're looking for things to do. And I found, uh, you know, look on TripAdvisor for things to do in Barcelona, that they had a, um, a trip you could book, a bus trip, that 
goes to uh, one, two, three, no, one, three, three countries in one day. Spain, France, and Andorra. Andorra. How many people know where Andorra is? How many have ever heard of Andorra? Okay, Ken's been there, right? Is there any place you haven't been, Ken? He's my hero. Anyway, so uh, it was three countries, one day, and so it started off in Barcelona. We stopped at a place called Montserrat. Maybe you've heard of that. It's pretty famous. It's an old, um, oh, what is it, a monastery um, that goes way back. And it was like um, kind of boring for us because it was 100% everything there was about Catholic and Catholic history, which we didn't have a huge interest in. And the fact was that almost everything there had been destroyed during conquest from different uh, regimes and rebuilt. So none of it was original. And so you, you're looking at this place, it's supposed to be very famous, and it's all rebuilt. It's kind of fake. And the, so that from there we went to the next picture. We went to uh, a couple places in France. This particular place is called um, Aix les Thermes, Thermes. I don't know how the French, who speaks French here? A X L E T H E R M E S. Well, we know that Thermes is an uh, offshoot of thermal or vice versa. And these are hot springs. It's very well known for its hot springs. And this is a hot springs pool right in the middle of their town square. And if you look real closely, second person from the left going, no, third, in the blue jacket. That's Patty. Now, you wouldn't know that if I didn't tell you, but she, she enjoyed it, I think, uh, notwithstanding the blisters from the hot water, but uh, beyond that, it was a nice little visit. Um, from there we go next. This is uh, the foothills of the Pyrenees M mountain range. They call them the pre-Pyrenees. That's actually, a, that's actually their technical name. Next. Now this is the Pyrenees for reals. This is up in uh, Andorra. And if you look closely in the foreground, you can see all the ski lifts there. Um, that's uh, a very famous ski spot for Europeans to escape to. Next. And there we are. Uh, photoshopped our faces on there to say we've been there. <laughs> Next. This is the capital of Andorra. Andorra La Vela, and it's an interesting place. There's only like 100,000 people in the whole country. And their claim to fame and their, their income source is it's an international banking center because they have structured their tax laws to make it very uh, advantageous for financial centers to establish themselves there. Plus, it's a duty-free zone, the entire city, and so people come there to shop. And so if you walk the main drag there that you're looking at, we walk both sides, uh, you find shops that have prices that um, have too many zeros on them for us, way too many zeros. Uh, their secondary uh, source of income as a country is tourism. And their third primary source of income, you will never guess, in 100 years. Anybody want to take a stab? They grow tobacco. Now go back one picture, honey. Does that look like South Carolina or Virginia to you? I mean, when you think tobacco, don't you think of humid, hot southern country, uh, southern states on the eastern seaboard? Next. Nope, that's the third source of it, third greatest source of income for this country. I didn't believe it when the guide told us. So I double checked it, you know, because I, I, Google and I are pretty close friends. And lo and behold, it's true. They grow lots of tobacco. Now, we don't know where they grow it because we didn't see five acres of flat land in the whole country because it's right buried in the middle of the Pyrenees. But the, so it apparently is so. Next. Okay, go back one. Okay. 
Now, the next stop, uh, we got back, that was one day trip. We got back and went to, uh, back to Barcelona. And we did some walking around. And we did, one day we spent most of the, well, at least half a day at uh, Sagrada Familia. Anybody hear of that? Now, I forgot to put the pictures of Sagrada Familia in this show. And if anybody is disappointed by that, I can make it up to them later. I'll bring them on a tablet. Uh, it is an amazing, amazing, amazing uh, structure. How long would it take to load that thumb drive? What's that? How long would it take to load that thumb drive? Oh, not that long. Whenever you're done here. Well, I'm, I'm done. I'm one frame from being done. Okay, first of all, um, is there more than six, one? Six, six shots in the folder. What's the name of the folder? Uh, or is it obvious? It's obvious, yeah. Okay, next, next frame. This is the very end of the trip. So I'm taking it out of order so we can try to get these church pictures up while we're winding down. What does that look like? Chick-fil-A. That is the original Chick-fil-A in Atlanta, Georgia. And that's part of the finale of the story. But you have to look at this because we, I want to try to get these uh, Sagrada Familia pictures up. And while he's trying to do that, I'll talk about our, our trip back. Um, when we got up the morning of our, oh, I forgot to mention, that whole trip to France and Andorra and back, there, there was, it was an optional tour, so everybody booked it independently. And what happened was that there was one Spanish speaker on the bus of 25 people. So the tour guide had to do the entire presentation in two different languages. And it was brutal. It was absolutely brutal. Okay, so this is one side of this church. Now, some things about Sagrada Familia. It's been under construction. I say been because it's not finished. For 127 years. It was started in the 1800s by none other than Antoni Gaudi, who is a very famous architect. Uh, I think the man had demons in his head. Uh, and some of his designs, but anyway, uh, next, this is another side of that church. Has anybody not seen pictures of this place? Because th this is stunning. This, the detail, the detail is incredible, and every single thing that you see has a meaning to it. It's either represent representative of something that happened in the Bible story, or something to do with the church, but it all has significance. The number of spires, the number of doors, the size of things is unbelievable. And this was designed in the 1880s. Next. This is a view of the ceiling. Now you see those columns. There's like two or three columns you can see. And they branch out at the top kind of like a palm tree. Those are designed to represent trees which represent the, the uh, magnificence of nature. He had meanings for everything. The columns, the branches, the, the things on the ceiling, next, and the stained glass. This stained glass is 360 degrees around this building. You can't turn in any direction without seeing stained glass. Next. This is uh, the center looking down from the, uh, the pipe organ and the lectern. And keep in mind, this place is tall. It's like about six stories tall, and there's an there's a underground level, too, where they hold mass. Um, but to think that this stuff was built over hundreds of years, or a hundred, over a hundred years, and that it, part of it was destroyed during the Spanish Civil War, including most of the plans and all the original models were destroyed during the war, and so they had to reconstruct everything from pieces and parts that were left over, and, and this is what they've got today. And it's, when I went there the first time to Barcelona, it was uh, about uh, 98, 1998, 
uh, they didn't even have it open because the interior was not finished enough. Now the interior is about done, and it's next. Go next. This this is again. This is everywhere. The, these stained glass. They had one guy. That's all he did. He had a workshop, and all he did was design stained glass panels. And again, every one has a picture that has some significance to it. And you can get a book that tells you what everything means, but it's it's overwhelming. The just the quantity. Next. And this gives you a, a sense of scale, uh, of how tall it is, because you can see the doorway at the end of that hallway. Next. And outside here, each of those little frescoes there and underneath the, uh, the support beams is a uh, portion of the, the life and death and resurrection of Christ. Uh, it's got pictures of the apostles, uh, Mary and Joseph, uh, it's all, it, it's a very reverent creation meant to honor its namesake, Sagrada Familia, the sacred family. And it was his, basically Gaudi's uh, contribution to the faith to build this um, memorial to the, the faith. Next, is that it? Okay. And, and so they had anticipated getting it finished. Their goal when we were there was to get it finished by 2026, which would have been the 100th anniversary of his death. He died, he got, died in 2000, or 1926 after getting hit by a streetcar. Okay, so that's it for the tour. Then we had to get home. We woke up to find out that our flight was delayed two hours. And we had a two-hour layover in Atlanta, so we knew we were going to miss the connection. So we went to Delta. They had a customer representative to help people like us. They were absolutely unbelievable in how they accommodated us. From Barcelona, they rebooked our flight. They took our bags and shipped them on ahead. They gave us vouchers for meals, arranged transportation. It couldn't have been better. I'm a Delta fan for life. Uh, so anyway, on the way to the hotel, we went by the Chick-fil-A. Uh -oh. Now, just coincidentally, uh -oh. that was it that day, honey, before we went to the hotel, or the next day you had your first Chick-fil-A sandwich? Pardon me? The day after. The day after when we were waiting to catch our outgoing flight, she had her first Chick-fil-A sandwich and loved it. Uh, and then she got to see the very first restaurant in the chain ever. Okay, that's it. Yeah.